Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to XJW Diaries. My name is Justin. So let's talk about love. Let's talk about marriage. Let's talk about toxic relationships. Why? Because as witnesses, the Watchtower really twisted our view of what life was like outside the organization. And the Watchtower also twisted our view of how life was like inside the organization. And one of the biggest subjects that they did this with is marriage. As witnesses, we were given the impression that all witnesses have this fantastic, beautiful, healthy marriage. And that anybody that didn't, well, they weren't put in the kingdom interest first. We were given the impression that cheating, divorces, domestic abuse, emotional abuse, those were things that were exclusive to the world. In reality, those things are quite prominent in the witnesses. And in fact, this is something that you don't have to leave the witnesses to realize. I had one of my friends tell me a story about an elder in his old congregation. And this elder would play matchmaker to help the young people to find their mates. But this elder had to stop doing that. Why? Because the men kept hitting their wives. So you see all these marital issues, toxic relationships, that's not just for the world, that's going on right inside the organization. Around the time that I was going through my waking up journey, this was back in early 2017, all of these child abuse cases were coming out against the witnesses. And these were just the ones that we've seen. There's a lot of cases that get settled out at court. And people started to call the witnesses a pedophile paradise. Maybe some of you guys remember that. Well, I would like to add that the witnesses are also an abuser's paradise. In this video, I'll explain why. Let me know what you think. And if you have any stories of your own that you feel comfortable sharing, please drop a comment below. You never know who it might help or who it might help wake up. So before we get into dating and marriage and all that stuff, let's just start at the foundation, which is the very, very, male-dominated culture of the Jehovah's Witnesses. In Jehovah's Witness culture, women are to view men as their head. Women are not allowed to have any position of authority. If a woman is to lead out for field service or say a prayer, she is to have a head covering, even if that head covering is a napkin. Women are under constant ridicule for the way they dress. In fact, even young girls are taught that if they wear a dress that's too high or a top that's too low and she stumbles a brother, she would be at fault. They never say anything about how men well into their 40s and 50s shouldn't even be stumbled by a 12-year-old girl. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So when I was first getting ingrained into the witnesses at a young age, these views towards women, they were very alien to me. You see, because I come from a family of very powerful women. My great-grandmother was a high-end regional manager at Seas Candies. And this was back during a time when women were not given those kind of positions, especially black women. My grandmother on my mom's side literally has her own day in Seattle. You know how hard it is to get your own day dedicated to you while you're still alive? My grandmother on my dad's side very, very high-end manager at Boeing. Traveled the world for them. And then there's my mom. My mom is a certified teacher, master's degree. I have personally seen her take countless kids that are be very, very below grade level, and I've seen her bring them so far above grade level that school becomes too easy for them. Now, in a normal society, normal, healthy society, these type of people would be seen as leaders examples. But in the witnesses, not only are they not seen as leaders, they cannot ever be given a position of authority, and they cannot even speak in a way that would give the impression that they're giving some direction. In fact, back in 2016, the Watchtower actually revised the lyrics to one of their canon melodies, which is a book of songs that's sung by witnesses before 
during and after each meeting. This particular song was originally called Guard Your Heart and the lyrics of the song followed that title. But the title of the song and lyrics were changed to We Guard Our Hearts. Why? Because when a woman or newcomer or young person sang Guard Your Heart, it could be taken that she is telling a brother what to do. Here's another one. At Bethel, the JW headquarters, they had a rule where women were not even allowed to sit at the foot or head of dining room tables. So you see, the witnesses are not just a male-dominated culture. No, this is a toxic male-dominated culture. I mean, how insecure in your masculinity do you have to be to be offended by a woman singing certain song lyrics? Or to be offended by a woman sitting at a certain place at the table? Really? From a very young age, young Jehovah's Witness girls are programmed that they are less than just because of their gender. In a lot of Jehovah's Witness magazines, videos, and books, women are depicted as being in the kitchen cooking, cleaning the house, or serving their husbands. So basically, the Watchtower has their clocks set back to the 1800s. Let's talk about the Jehovah's Witness dating culture. For witnesses, there isn't really such thing as dating. There's really just Courting. In other words, you must date only with the intention of marriage. And once you start dating, the pressure to marry comes right away. In fact, it's not at all uncommon to hear people talking about potential marriage even before they started to officially date. They don't even know each other's middle names yet. I'll come back to that later. Having that much pressure over you is already pretty unhealthy, but what this also means is that Jehovah's Witnesses don't have the freedom to really test compatibility. Most of the witnesses I knew married the first person that they had a serious relationship with. Anyone who does date around too much typically gets thrown into that bad association category. Then there's the dating pool. You can only date other Jehovah's Witnesses, which makes 99% of the population automatically ineligible. You are also only supposed to date witnesses who are in good standing. That cuts things down further. Then you have the titles. Some people only want to date someone who was a pioneer or a servant. That cuts things down again. And then you have the gender ratio. In most areas, there are far more women Jehovah's Witnesses than men. In fact, in my area, at one time, the ratio was three women for every one man. So that cuts down the pool even more. Then you have deal breakers. One of my big deal breakers was that I wanted kids. There's surprisingly a lot of Jehovah's Witness women who don't want kids or who are waiting for the new system. That cut my pool down dramatically. I could go on, but the point is your dating pool is small, which unfortunately means people are getting stuck with people that they probably wouldn't be with in the real world, but when those options are running out, you gotta just take what you can get. Then there's the fact that witnesses can't truly be upfront with each other. This was my biggest headache when dating as a witness. Everything you do, everything you say, every opinion you share is being analyzed. Are you one of the good witnesses or are you one of those fence-sitting, double-life-living bad witnesses? I figured out real quick I couldn't be myself. You can never be fully authentic, which means even in the dating stages, you are already learning how to hide things from your significant other. Because you know if she were to see your Jay-Z collection or your movie library, she might be cool with it. Or she might break up with you and report you to the elders, which could have the possibility of ruining your reputation, making it much harder to get with someone new. And here's another thing. Witnesses are super susceptible to anything they hear from the platform or read in the magazines. So someone might be cool with something one day, and then they hear a talk, and the very next day, that same thing will bother their conscience. So just think about that. You are getting pressured to marry, make a lifelong commitment with someone that you may not be fully compatible with, to someone that you may not have chosen to be with under normal circumstances with a wider dating pool, to someone that you are already learning how to section off pieces of yourself from, and they're learning how to do the same with you but it gets worse. So point blank, as witnesses, we were taught nothing about the deeper, core level, actually important red flags to look out for. When it comes to identifying the deeper mental and emotional red flags, we were left in the dark. And once again, we gotta talk about titles because if a woman was a pioneer or a man was appointed an elder or a servant, that title would often overshadow any clear red flags. There's also a major lack of mental health awareness in the witness community. 
So we weren't taught how to spot signs of an undiagnosed mental disorder, unless it was very obvious. So as witnesses, we really were not prepared on what things to look out for for warning signs of red flags. There was this naive assumption that we, many of us had, that if somebody's going to meetings and they're going out in service and they're going through all the motions of being a witness, it's a green light, especially if they hold some position. If they're a pioneer, servant, elder, even more of a green light. But the reality is that, unfortunately, there are witnesses out there who have gone into marriage, permanent arrangement, and they realize that the person they're with has some serious issues. Overly controlling, emotionally abusive, sometimes physically abusive, anger issues, maybe an undiagnosed mental health issue. And the really sad part about that is that a lot of times these people, they show you exactly who they are. They show you who they are. But because we were kept so naive as witnesses, all those clear warning signs, those clear red flags flew right by us. So another thing that's quite common in the witness community is having very large age gaps. Most of the time with a significantly older man marrying a significantly younger woman. And again, you have a very male dominated culture. So when you also add a 10 plus year age gap, now the power dynamic shifts even more towards the man. When you have a 35 year old man marrying a 19 year old woman, in the JW culture, chances are that 19 year old girl isn't going to have much of a voice in that relationship. Now I know some people say age is just a number. I also know some people who say that are named R. Kelly, just saying. And that leads me right into another more concerning aspect of these age gaps, which is seeing Jehovah's Witness men well into their adult years checking out girls who are 15, 16 years old. And as if that's not already creepy enough, in some cases, these older men are secretly dating these underaged girls. Again, <laughs> they're secretly dating underaged girls, and then they marry them shortly after they turn 18. So I'll tell you a little story, true story here. When I was about 14 years old, I met this girl. She lived about an hour away from where I was living at that time. And I don't know, maybe it's just me, maybe an empath thing, I don't know. But you ever meet somebody and you can just tell, excuse my language here, but you can just tell they have been through some shit, if you know what I'm saying. That, unfortunately, was this girl. So my mom became friends with her grandmother. This girl's parents lived in a completely different state. They were also witnesses. Um, but I think just the fact that she didn't live with her parents, that kind of says a lot on its own. I'm trying not to say too much. I'm trying to be respectful. I don't want to say anything that's too identifying of her. But we got to know them. We became friends with them. And some time went on and something very traumatic happened. Again, I'm not trying to say too much, but something traumatic happened with her and her grandmother. She was able to recover mostly, but her grandmother wasn't as able to recover. That's going to come, come into importance later on in the story. So she starts getting into trouble. Now, again, she's had a very, very tough life, very hard upbringing. She's getting into trouble. She ends up getting disfellowshipped. Now let's just, let's just pause there for a second, because in a normal, healthy society, a girl like that, that's been through everything that she's been through, they would see her getting into trouble as a call for help, a call for attention. But in the witnesses, they disfellowship her. In the witnesses, they rip her away from her friends, her community, her support system, and isolate her. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Now, I'm, I'm, I try to be a fair person. I try to be a fair person. So I can understand that maybe there would be some parents that, you know, this girl's getting into trouble. I don't want my kids hanging around her. I, I get that. But why wouldn't they at least, especially knowing everything that she's been through, why wouldn't they at least say, hey, here's, you know, four older sisters that are in 
good standing that are very strong. We're going to take those people and they're going to be your new support system, your new mentor, so to speak, as you work towards reinstatement. Why can't they do something like that rather than just casting you out and isolating you, especially after you've been through horrific things? So fast forward a little bit. Now this girl is 16 years old. Remember that number now, 16, okay? She starts, unfortunately, getting into trouble again. And because of the incident that happened with her and her grandmother, her grandmother's not really able to keep up, up with her as much. So she's just kind of running around, doing her thing, getting into trouble. An elder and his wife decide that they'll take her in, be her new caretakers, help keep her on the straight and narrow, so to speak. She moves in with this elder and his wife. I'm sure you can already guess where this story is going to go. And spoiler alert, you are correct. Because by the time this girl turns 18 years old, she is disfellowshipped again. As is the elder that she moved in with, who is now divorced from his wife. And who is now getting married to this girl, who is pregnant with his child. So I bet this girl hasn't already been through enough. She's now 18 years old, getting married to a man who's in his mid to late 40s at that time. Now, it was well known in that congregation that this elder was sleeping with this girl long before she turned 18. That's why he got divorced from his wife in the first place. Do you think anybody called the police? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's kind of funny that witnesses, they walk around with this moral superiority over everybody else. But then they got stuff like this going on. And it's so normalized. It's so normalized to see a young girl who doesn't even have a good layer of dust on her high school diploma yet. You know? But yet she's making this lifelong commitment to a man who is in a completely different stage of his life and nobody says anything, but let's go deeper. So for most people, when you start dating somebody, you try to present yourself in the best light, right? I mean, we all have our good days and bad days, but you want them to see mostly your good days. That's why sometimes you'll hear that when you are first getting to know somebody, you're not really getting to know them, you're getting to know their representative. But for witnesses, that can be a big issue. Because witnesses race into marriage with such speed that they can make a Ferrari jealous. Out of the many JW weddings I attended, the majority of them had only dated for three to eight months, with six months being the average. The fastest was one single month. Now, in some cases, the couple had known each other for years before they started dating. Makes things a little safer. But in most of these cases, the couples had gone from saying, nice to meet you, to saying I do in less time that it takes for trees to grow back their leaves. They are rushing into marriage so fast that oftentimes they don't get to see who the person really is at a deeper level. And for that matter, in the JW culture where things are so controlled and so suppressed, chances are you don't even know yourself at a deeper level. Oh, and let's not forget all the sexual repression in the JW culture, right? Which unfortunately means that a lot of these couples are not really thinking clearly. They're thinking through their hormones, which are raging, and they don't want to sin. And so consequently, in a roundabout way, with that type of setup, they have made sex more important than love. Now, of course, it wouldn't be fair to say that's the case every single time. Not fair at all. But I'm sure we can all think of plenty of examples where instead of a marriage being between two adults who are head of our heels in love with each other, the marriage is instead between two basically kids who have a really strong crush on each other and want to be able to sleep with each other without getting in trouble. And to add another piece of the puzzle, in the witnesses, if you are engaged and you break that engagement, you could face being reproved, which means that they're putting even more pressure on these people even if their relationship is already starting to turn sour. And meanwhile, through all this rushing, 
have they really had a chance to see how compatible they are at a deeper level and not just at a surface level? Have they had a chance to really see if they share a deep bond? And not just the bond of both being witnesses. Have they had a chance to really examine this person and make sure they aren't displaying any clear red flags? Especially in the case of a woman, since this man is now going to be your spiritual head. Have they actually had a chance to see who they are really marrying? To fully understand them at a core level? To see how they are on their bad days? To see what unhealed hurt they may be carrying around from their childhood? To see how their parents' relationship may have impacted their view of relationships? Now, all of those things are very important for anybody considering something as serious as marriage. But unfortunately, a lot of these Jehovah's Witness couples have not thought about those things. Because again, we were under the impression, the false impression, that anybody who's a witness, that's going through all the motions of being a witness, they're good. But what if they aren't? So in the Jehovah's Witness culture, the only proper way to get a divorce is through either adultery or somebody passing away. That's it. Either somebody has to cheat or somebody has to die. <laughs> That's your only options out. And if you decide to go through with a divorce anyways, you can get disfellowshipped. This means if a woman rushes into marriage with a man, and that man turns out to be physically abusive, she cannot get a divorce. If a man marries a woman, and she starts to display severe mental imbalances to the point where she puts his life in danger, he cannot get a divorce. The most these people can do, if things get severe enough, is get a legal separation. What's worse? There are articles produced by the Watchtower encouraging women in abusive marriages to stay with their abuser and try to win them over with their Christian and love. And this is the mindset they are teaching to young girls. Now, if you decide to continue with getting a divorce, not only do you risk possibly getting disfellowshipped, but you will also remain unscripturally fit for marriage. This means you must stay single. And if someone tries to date you, they can get disfellowshipped. If you want to be scripturally free to marry again, you'll need proof of adultery. In other words, you'll need proof that your ex has slept with someone else. People who have been divorced already have an awkward relationship with each other. But now imagine and you have to try to spy on your ex to get some proof that they have been with someone else. Crazy. And that's even in the case where one mate is no longer a Jehovah's Witness. In fact, in my area, this was you know, probably about two, three years ago, there was a local elder, I know him well, who was going to this guy's house. He had moved here from another state. And this elder was going to this guy's house, parking in front of his house, just stalking him. And the reason why he was doing that is because this man was formerly married to a Jehovah's Witness in the state that he came from before. And this elder was trying to see if this man was sleeping with somebody else now that he moved here. That way he can send a message back to his ex-wife to say, hey, your ex-husband is sleeping with somebody else, and now you are scripturally free to marry again. And sadly, this manipulation even goes on within a marriage. In some cases, when a partner finds out that, you know, their their marriage mate is toxic, or, you know, maybe they just figure out that they're not really into each other. Well, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that they try to manipulate that situation. They try to withhold sex. They try to position that person into a situation where they are more likely to cheat. And when that happens and they get their proof, then they're free to marry somebody else. It's a setup. So think about all these things. You've got a very male dominated culture, a toxic male dominated culture out of that. You've got a dating culture that doesn't really allow you to test compatibility and where you may be in a relationship with somebody that you probably wouldn't have chosen under normal circumstances with a normal sized dating pool. You have the inability to read red flags, see clear warning signs. You have a culture that already has a serious lack of mental health awareness. You have the inability to divorce. You have severe age gaps sometimes and Sometimes those age gaps are very inappropriate. If you take all those ingredients and mix them together, you have a perfect recipe for an abuser's paradise, where people who have some serious issues can jump into a marriage with somebody who 
doesn't really know themselves, hasn't had a chance to get to know the other person, and they can they can treat them however they want because they know that they cannot get out of it. So for anybody out there that is just now getting out of the witnesses, I apologize. Um, I'm sure that the last thing you want to do after getting out of something like that is to listen to yet another man tell you what you should do. <laughs> but if you're willing to listen, I'll just say, you know, coming out of a culture like that, something that toxic is probably a good idea to get some counseling. That was the best thing I did after leaving the witnesses. I'm glad I did it sooner after leaving rather than later. It really helped my recovery. And, you know, you never know being in a culture like that, you never know what of that toxicity has rubbed off on you. And you want to make sure that you're, you know, you can purge that out and get rid of it, deprogram yourself. That way you're not spreading that toxicity to somebody else. But beyond all that, isn't it interesting though, how an organization that speaks so much about love, how they mishandle love? Because if they really did love us, they would have taught us about compatibility and how important that is. They would have taught us to respect marriage and you know take our time with it. Don't just rush into it with somebody that you hardly know. They would have taught us about red flags. You know, they would have taught us that you need to look more into a person than just their title or who their family is or how they answer or how much hours they turn in. Those things are superficial. They don't really matter when it comes to building a long lasting, healthy relationship with somebody. But more than anything else, they would have taught us, if they really cared about us, they would have taught us how worthy we all are. Because if you know your worth, then you won't ever let somebody treat you less than your worth. But instead, they constantly reminded us how worthless we are. You know, you're a sinner, you're a slave, you're unworthy, all this guilt, all this fear that they put on us. And so, Sadly, because of that, there's a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, and let's be honest, it's mostly women who are in these situations, who are with someone that is treating them worthless. And because they've had that programmed into their head that they're less than, some of these women sadly think that they deserve it. But that's not the truth at all, is it? That's the biggest lie ever, because we all deserve the very best. So hopefully you guys enjoy that. Thanks for watching. I got another one on the way. Stay tuned. I'll catch you in the next one.